This play is called Our Town. It was written by Thornton Wilder and is being produced here by the Westport Country Playhouse. Name of the town, Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, just over the line from Massachusetts. Latitude 42 degrees 40 minutes, longitude 70 degrees 37 minutes. First act shows a day in our town. Day is May 7th, 1901, just about dawn. Yep, just about. Skies beginning to show some streaks of light in the east there, behind our mountain. Morning star always gets wonderful bright. Just a minute for it has to go. Well, better show you how our town lies. Up here is Main Street. Cutting across it on the left is the railroad tracks. Other side of the tracks is Polish town. Uh, foreign families mostly come here to work in the mill, a couple of Canuck families and the uh, Catholic church. Congregational church is here, Presbyterians across the street, Methodist and Unitarian are there, and the Baptist is down in the hollow by the river. Next to the post office, town hall. Jail is in the basement. William Jennings Bryan once made a speech from those steps right there. Then along Main Street, there's a row of stores, hitching posts, horse blocks in front of them. First automobile is going to come along in about five years. Belonged to Banker Cartwright, our town's richest citizen. Lives in the uh, big white house on the hill. Uh, there is the grocery store and Mr. Morgan's drugstore. Most everybody in town manages to look into one of those stores at least once a day. This is our doctor's house, Doc Gibbs. There's the back door, and uh, here come a couple of trellises for those of you who feel like you need scenery. This is Mrs. Gibbs' garden. Beans, peas, corn, hollyhock, heliotrope, and uh, a lot of burdock. In those days, town newspaper came out twice a week, Grover's Corner Sentinel. And this is Editor Webb's house. This is Mrs. Webb's garden. Same as Mrs. Gibbs, except it's got some sunflowers. Then right here is a big butternut tree. It's a nice town. Know what I mean? Nobody very remarkable come out of it, near as we know. Earliest dates on the tombstones in the cemetery say 1670. They are Grovers and Cartwrights and Gibbses and Hersey's. Uh, same names as are around here now. Well, like I said, early morning. Only lights on in town are in a cottage across the tracks where a Polish mother's just given birth to twins. And in uh, Joe Kroll's house, Joe Jr.'s getting ready to deliver the morning paper. And then uh, down at the depot, where Shorty Hawkins is getting ready to flag the 545 for Boston. There it is. Of course, all around in the country, the lights have been on for some time, what with milking and everything, but um, town folks sleep late. So, another day has begun. Here comes Doc Gibbs, starting down Main Street after taking care of that baby case, and um, here comes Ms. Gibbs, down to cook breakfast. Doc Gibbs died in 1930. New hospitals named after him. Uh, Ms. Gibbs died first, a long time ago, in fact. She went out to visit her daughter, Rebecca, who had married an insurance salesman in Canton, Ohio, and, uh, and she died there, pneumonia. But her body was brought back here, and she's up there in the cemetery, along with a whole mess of Gibbses and Hersey's. She was Julia. Percy, before she married Julia. Yes, she was Julia. She was Julia, Percy, before she married Doc Gibbs in the Congregational Church. In our town, we like to know the facts about everybody. Here's Mrs. Webb coming down to cook breakfast, and uh, that's Doc Gibbs. 
got the call to go to Polish town half past one this morning. And here comes Joe Crow delivering the papers. Morning, Doc. Morning, Joe. Want your paper now? Yes, I'll take it. Anybody been sick, Doc? No, some uh, twins over in Polish town, Joe. I see your teacher, Miss Foster, is going to get married. Yes, sir, to a fellow over in Concord. I declare, well, how do you boys feel about that? Well, of course, it ain't none of my business. But I think if a person starts out a teacher, she ought to stay one. Sure. <laughs> How's your knee, Joe? Oh, it's fine. I never think about it at all. Only like you said, it always tells me when it's going to rain. Who was it telling you today? Going to rain? No, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. Do you ever make a mistake? No, sir. I want to tell you something about that boy, Joe Crow. Joe was awful bright. Graduated ahead of his class here and got a scholarship to Boston Tech. MIT, that is. Graduated head of his class there, too. It was all written up in the Boston papers. Going to be a great engineer, Joe was. Then the war come along and he died in France. All that education for nothing. Of course, what business he had picking a quarrel with the Germans, we can't make out to this day. But it did seem perfectly clear at the time. Get out, Missy. What's the matter Here comes you? Howie Newsom delivering the milk. Good morning, Doc. Morning, Howie. Somebody sick? There are twins over there. Mrs. Gorslowski's. Twins, eh? This town keeps getting bigger every year. <laughs> Gonna rain, Howie. Oh, no, no. Fine day. That'll burn through. Hello, Bessie. <laughs> How old is she, Howie? She's going on 17. See, Bessie's all mixed up about the route. Ever since the Lockhart stopped taking their quart of milk every day. She wants to leave them a quart just the same. She keeps scolding me the whole trip. Morning, Howie. Morning, Miss Gibbs. Doc's just coming down the street. Is he? Seems like you're late today. Yeah, something wrong with the separator. Don't know what twas. Doc. Howie. Children, children, time to get up. George, Rebecca. Everything all right, Frank? Yes, I declare. Easy as can. Well, bacon will be ready in a minute. Mm. Here, sit down and drink your coffee. You can get a couple of hours sleep this morning, can't you? Well, Mrs. Wentworth's coming at 11. Guess I know what it's about, too. Her uh, stomach ain't what it ought to be. Well, all told, you won't get more than three hours sleep. Frank Gibbs, I don't know what's going to become of you. I do wish you could go away someplace and take a rest. I think it would do you good. Emily, time to wake up. Wally, 7 o'clock. I declare you've got to speak to George. Seems like something's come over him lately. He's no good to me at all. I can't even get him to cut me some wood. Is he sassy to you? No, he just whines. All he thinks about is that baseball. George, Rebecca, you'll be late for school. Uh, George? George, look sharp. Yes, Pa? Don't you hear your mother calling you? Wally, you'll be late for school. Guess I'll go upstairs. Take 40 weeks. <laughs> Wally, you wash yourself good now, or else I'll come up there and do it for you. Mom, what dress shall I wear? Hush now. Don't make a noise. Your father's been out all night and he needs his rest. I washed and ironed the blue gingham for your special. Mom, I hate that dress. Oh, hush up with you. Well, every day I go to school dressed like a sick turkey. Oh, now, Rebecca, you always look very nice. Oh, Mama, George is throwing soap at I me. will come up there and slap the both of yous. That's what I'll do. We got a mill. In our town, too. Makes blankets. Cartwrights own it, and it brung them a fortune. Children, now I won't have it. Breakfast is as good as any other meal, and I won't have you gobbling it down like wolves. It'll stunt your growth. That's a fact. Wally, put away that book. Oh, Ma, by 10 o'clock, I gotta know all about Canada. You know the rules well as I do. No reading at the table. As for me, I'd rather have my children healthy than bright. I'm both, Mama. You know I am. I'm the brightest girl in school for my age. I have a wonderful memory. Eat your breakfast. I will talk to your father about it after he's rested. 
It seems to me 25 cents a week is enough for a boy your age. I declare I don't know how you spend it all. Oh, Ma, I got a lot of things to buy. Strawberry phosphates, that's what you spend it on. I don't see how Rebecca comes to have so much money. She has more than a dollar. Well, I've been saving it up gradual. Well, dear, I think it's a good idea to spend some every now and then. Mama, hmm? do you know what I love most in this world? Do you? Money. Eat your breakfast. Oh, Mama, there's the first bell. I gotta go. Now, you can walk fast, but don't run. Wally, pull your pants up at the knee. Okay, goodbye. Morning, Emily. Morning, George. Tell Miss Foster I sent her my best congratulations. Can you remember that? Yes, Ma. And you look very nice, Rebecca. Pick up your feet. Here, chick, 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 chick. No, not you. You go away, you. Oh, fight, fight, fight. That's all you do. What's the matter with you? You don't belong to me. Where'd you come from? Here. Oh, now, don't be scared. Nobody's gonna hurt you. <laughs> Morning, Myrtle. How's your cold? Well, I still get that tickling feeling in the back of my throat. I told Charles I don't know as I'll go to choir practice tonight. Have you tried singing over your voice? Yes, but I can't seem to stay on the key. <laughs> so while I'm resting, I thought I'd string some of these beans. Well, here, let me help you. Beans have been good this year. Yeah. Thought I'd put up 40 quarts if it kills me. The children say they hate them, but I notice they get them down all winter. Now, Myrtle, I have got to tell you something, because if I don't tell somebody, I'm going to burst. My Julian Gibbs. Myrtle, did one of those second-hand furniture men from Boston come visit you last Friday? No. Well, he called on me. First, I thought he was a patient just wanting to see Dr. Gibbs. And then he wormed his way into my parlor and Myrtle Webb, he offered me $350 for Grandmother Wentworth's high boy as I am sitting here. Why, Julia Gibbs! He did! Why, that old thing? Why, it was so big, I didn't even know where I put it. I almost give it to Cousin Hester Wilcox. Well, you're going to take it, aren't you? Well, I don't know. You don't know? Julia, $350, what's come over you? Well, if I could get the doctor to take it and go away someplace on a trip, I would sell it like that. You know, Myrtle, it's been the dream of my life to see Paris, France. <laughs> oh, I know, I know it sounds crazy, I suppose. But for years I promised myself that if we ever got the chance... How does the I, doctor feel about well, it? Well, I did beat around the bush a little, and I told him that if I got a legacy, that's how I put it, I would make him take me. What did he say? Oh, well, you know him. I haven't heard a serious word out of him since I've known him. No, he said. It would make him discontented with Grover's Corners to go traipsing about Europe. Better let well enough alone, he says. Every two years he visits the battlefields of a civil war, and that's enough treat for anybody, he says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Mr. Webb just admires the way Doc Gibbs knows everything about the civil um. war. Mr. Webb's got a good mind to give up Napoleon and move over to the civil war, except... Doc Gibbs being one of the greatest experts in the country just makes him despair. <laughs> well, it is a fact. Dr. Gibbs is never so happy as when he's at Antietam or Gettysburg. The times I have walked over those hills, Myrtle, stopping at every bush, pacing it all out, like we was going to buy it. <laughs> oh. Well, if that second-hand man is really serious about buying it, Julia, you sell it. Then you'll get to see Paris. You just keep dropping hints from time to time. That's how I got to see the Atlantic Ocean, you know. Well, oh, I'm sorry I mentioned it. Only it seems to me that once in your life before you die, you ought to see a country where they don't talk in English and they don't even want to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. And now we'll skip a few hours, but uh, before we do, we need a little more information about our town, a kind of a scientific account, you might say. 
So I have asked a professor Willard of the State University to sketch in a few details of our past history here. Professor Willard. Professor Willard? Oh, well, just a few brief notes. Professor, unfortunately, our time is limited. Oh, well. Well, Grover's Corners. <laughs> well, now, let me see, yes. Well, Grover's Corners lies on the old Pliocene granite uh, of the Appalachian Range. <laughs> I may say it's some of the oldest land in the world, and we're very proud of that here. <laughs> of course... There are some more recent outcroppings, sandstone showing through a shelf of Devonian basalt and some vestiges of Mesozoic shale, but these are comparatively new, perhaps, what, oh, two, three hundred million years, yes. Oh, and some highly interesting fossils have been found. No, no, I may say unique fossils, yes. <laughs> Just two miles north of the Peckham farm in Silas Peckham's cow pasture. <laughs> well, now, these may be seen in the museum uh, at the university uh, at any time. Uh, well, uh, of course, that is at any reasonable time. Oh, uh, shall I read some of Professor Gruber's notes on the meteorological situation, the mean precipitation, etc.? Well, huh? well, I'm afraid we don't have time for that, Professor, but you might say a few brief words on the history of man here. Oh. Oh, anthropological data. Yes. Yes, very good. Yes, well, early Amerindian stock. Kotahatchee tribes, no evidence before the 10th century of this era, now entirely disappeared. Yes, oh, possible traces in three families. Oh, and migration, oh, migration in the early part of the 17th century of English brachiocephalic blue-eyed stock. Uh, since then, some uh, Slav and uh, Mediterranean. Yes. Well, uh, the population, Professor. Well, within the town limits, why, it's a 2,640. Just a minute. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, the population at the moment <laughs> is 2,642. <laughs> The uh, postal district brings in 507 more, making a total of what? Uh, uh, 3,149. Yes, uh, mortality birth rates constant by McPherson's gauge. That's 6.032. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, not at all, sir. Thank you. <laughs> not at all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and now a political and a social report from Editor Webb. Mr. Webb. He'll be out in a minute. He just cut his hand whilst eating an apple. Charles, everybody's waiting. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Webb is the editor and the publisher of the Grover's Corner Septal. That's our local. Well, I don't have to tell you that we're run here by a board of selectmen. All males vote at the age of 21. Women vote indirect. We're, uh, we're lower middle class, a sprinkling of professional men, 10% illiterate laborers. Now, politically, we're 86% Republicans, 6% Democrats, 4% Socialists. Rest indifferent. Religiously, we're 85% Protestants, 12% Catholics. Rest indifferent. Any comment, Editor Webb? Very ordinary town, if you ask me. A little better behaved than most. Probably a lot duller. 
But our young people here seem to like it well enough. 90% of them graduating from high school settle down right here to live, even when they've been away to college. Is there anyone who would like to ask Editor Webb some questions? Yes, yes. Is there much drinking in Grover's Corners? Well, ma'am, I wouldn't know what you'd call much. Saturday nights, the fam hands meet down in Elry Grenell's stable and haul us some. And, uh, oh, we've got one or two town drunks. <laughs> but they're always having remorses every time an evangelist comes to town. So, no, ma'am, I'd say liquor ain't a regular thing in the home here. Except in the medicine chest. Right good for snake bite, you know. Always was. Is there no one in town aware Excuse me, could you just speak louder so we can hear you? Is there no one in town aware of social injustice and industrial inequality? Oh, yes, everybody is. Something terrible. Seems like they spend most of their time talking about who's rich and who's poor. Then why don't they do something about it? Well, I don't know. I guess we're all hunting, like everybody else, for a way that the, the diligent and sensible can rise to the top and the lazy and quarrelsome sink to the bottom, but that ain't easy to find. Meantime, we do all we can to take care of those that can't help themselves. And those that can, we leave alone. Are there any other questions? Mr. Webb? Mr. Webb, is there any culture or love of beauty in Grover's Corners? Well, ma'am, there ain't much. Not in the sense you mean. Oh, now, uh, come to think of it, there's some girls that play the piano over the high school commencement. But they ain't happy about it. No, ma'am, there, there isn't much culture. But maybe this is the place to tell you that we have got a lot of pleasures of a kind here. We like the sun coming up over the mountain in the morning. And, uh, oh, we all notice a good deal about the birds. We pay a lot of attention to them. And we watch the change of the seasons. Yes, everybody knows about them. But uh, those other things, you're right, ma'am, there aren't much. Uh, Robinson Crusoe and the Bible and Handel's Largo. We all know that. And uh, Whistler's mother. And those are just about as fast as we go. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Editor Webb. And now we'll get back to our town. It is 2 o'clock. All 2,642 have had their lunches, dishes been washed, Children are back in school. There's kind of a buzzing and a humming coming from the school buildings. Not a lot of buggies on Main Street. Horses dozing at the hitching posts. Kind of early afternoon calms come over the town. You remember what that's like. Doc Gibbs is in his office tapping people on the chest and making them say, ah, and um, Editor Webb is cutting the lawn. One man in ten thinks it's a privilege to push his own lawnmower. I can't, Melissa. I've got to go home and help my mother. I promised. Emily, walk simply. Who do you think you are today? Oh, Papa, you're terrible. One minute you tell me to stand up straight, and the next minute you call me names. I just don't listen to you. Oh, golly, I have never been kissed by such a great lady before. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Forrest. I'm Go play in the fields, young man. Got no business playing baseball on Main Street. I'm awfully sorry, Mrs. Forrest. Well, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Van Schiff. Hello, Emily. 
Hello. You made a fine speech in class. Well, I, I was really ready to make a speech about the Monroe Doctrine, but at the last minute, Miss Cochran made me talk about the Louisiana Purchase instead. I worked an awful long time on both of them. Gee, it's funny, Emily. From my window up there, I can just see your head nights when you're doing your homework over in your room. Why can't you? You certainly do stick to it, Emily. I don't see how you can sit still that long. I guess you must like school. Well, I always feel it's something you have to go through. Yeah? I don't mind it, really. It passes the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Emily, what do you think we might work out a kind of telegraph from your window to mine? And once in a while, you could give me a kind of hint or two about one of those algebra problems. <laughs> I don't mean the answers, Emily. Oh, no, of course it's not. Just uh, some little hint. Oh, I think hints are allowed. So, um, if you get stuck, George, you whistle to me and I'll give you some hints. Emily, you're just naturally bright, I guess. <laughs> I figure it's just the way a person's born. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, I want to be a farmer. My Uncle Luke says whenever I'm ready, I can come over and work on his farm. And if I'm any good, I can just gradually have it. You mean the house and everything? Yeah. Well, better be getting out to the baseball field. Thanks for the talk, Emily. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Webb. Good afternoon, George. So long, Emily. So long, George. Emily, come help me string these beans for the winter. Well, that George Gibbs let himself have a real conversation, didn't he? Let's see. How old would George be now? Oh, I don't know. We must be about 16. Mama, I made a speech in class today and I was very good. You must recite it to your father at supper. What was it about? The Louisiana Purchase. Uh. It was like silk off a spool. I'm going to make speeches all my life. Uh, Mama, are these big enough? Try and get them a little bigger if you can. Mama, will you answer me a question? Serious? Seriously, dear, not serious. Seriously, will you? Of course I will. Mama, am I good looking? Of course you are. Both my children got good features. I'd be ashamed if they hadn't. Oh, Mama, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, am I pretty? Well, I've already told you, yes, you've got a nice, young, pretty face. Now, that's enough of that foolishness. Oh, Mama, you never tell us the truth about anything. I am telling you the truth. Mama, were you pretty? Yes, I was, if I do say it. I was the prettiest girl in town. Next to Mamie Cartwright. Oh, but Mama, you've got to say something about me. Am I pretty enough to get anybody... To get people interested in me. Oh, Emily, stop it. You're making me tired. You are pretty enough for all normal purposes. Now, come along and bring that bowl with you. Oh, Mama, you're no help at all. Well, now is the time to tell you I think that the Cartwright interests are building a new bank in Grover's Corners. Had to go to Vermont for the marble, I'm sorry to say. And uh, they've asked some friends of mine what we should put in the cornerstone for people to dig up a thousand years from now. Of course, we are putting in a copy of the Grover's Corner Sentinel and the New York Times, and uh, we are interested in that because some scientific fellas have found a way of painting all that printed matter with a glue, a kind of a silicate glue. Make it keep for a thousand, two thousand years. Of course, uh, we are putting in a copy of the Constitution of the United States of America, and the Bible, and some of Shakespeare's plays. What do you say? What do you think? You know, Babylon had two million people in it, and all we know about them is Names of some kings, wheat contracts, sailor slaves, and yet every night, family had sat down to supper, uh, father had come home from work, smoke would go up the chimney, same as here, and even in Rome and Greece, all we know about the real life of those people 
is what we've been able to piece together from some of the hokey poems and the comedies that they wrote for the theater back then. So I'm going to have a copy of this play put in that cornerstone so that people a thousand years from now will know a few simple facts about us more than the Treaty of Versailles, Lindbergh's flight, so that people a thousand years from now will say this, this is the way we were. In the provinces north of New York at the beginning of the 20th century, this is the way we were in our growing up, in our marrying, in our living, and in our dying. Well, it's evening now. You can hear the choir practice starting in the Congregational Church. Children are home doing their schoolwork. And the day, just running down like a tired clock. Let's do it again. And remember, ladies, music came in the world to give pleasure. Now let's try it again. Let's be the time that Softer. Our in Christian love. Softer. The fellowship. Now look here, everybody. You get it out of your heads, that music's only good when it's loud. You leave loudness to the Methodists. You couldn't beat them even if you wanted to. Now again, tenors. at all. The moonlight's so terrible. Emily, did you get the third problem? Which? The third. Why, yes, George, that's the easiest of them all. Uh, I don't see it. Well, Emily, can you give me a hint? I'll tell you one thing. The answer's in yards. In yards? Well, how do you mean? In square yards. Oh, in square yards. Ah. Yes, George. Don't you see? I, I, yeah, yeah. In square yards of wallpaper. Oh, oh, I see. Square yards of wallpaper. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, Emily. You're welcome. My, isn't the moonlight terrible? And choir practice going on? I think if you hold your breath, you can hear the train all the way to Kentucook. Hear it? What do you know? Well, I guess I'd better go back and try to work. Good night, Emily. Good night, George. That's better. But it ain't no miracle. Before I forget it, how many of you will be able to come in Tuesday afternoon and sing at Fred Hersey's wedding? Show your hands. Oh, that'll be fine. That'll be right nice. Once again now, at the weary, 
Art thou languid? It's a question, ladies and gentlemen. Make it talk. And remember, Sunday, to take the second verse real soft and sort of die out at the end. Ready? Oh, George, can you come down a minute? Yes, Pa. Make yourself comfortable, George. I'll only keep you a minute. <clears throat> George, how old are you? Me? I'm 16. Almost 17. What do you want to do after school's over? Well, you know, Pa, I want to be a farmer on Uncle Luke's farm. You'll be willing, will you, to get up early and milk and feed the stock. You'll be able to hoe and hay all day. Well, sure, I will. What do you mean, Pa? Well, George, uh, while I was in my office today, I heard a funny sound. What do you think it was? It was your mother chopping wood. No, they see your mother getting up early, cooking meals all day long, washing and ironing. And still she has to go out in the backyard and chop wood. I suppose she just got tired of asking her just Gave up and decided it was easier to do it herself. And uh, you eat her meals, put on the clothes she keeps nice for you, and you run off and play baseball like she's some hired girl we keep around the house, but that we don't like very much. Well, I knew all I had to do was call it to your attention. Here's a handkerchief, son. George, I've decided to raise your spending money 25 cents a week. Not, of course, for chopping wood for your mother, because it's sort of a present you give her, but because you're getting older, and I imagine there are lots of things you must find to do with it. Thanks, Pa. Let's see. Tomorrow's payday. You can count on it. <laughs> Probably Rebecca will feel she ought to have some more, too. I wonder what could have happened to your mother. Choir practice never was as late as this before. It's only half past eight, Pa. I don't know why she's in that old choir anyway. She hasn't got any more voice than an old crow. Mm, traipsing around the streets this hour of the night. Just about time you retired. Don't you think? Yes, Pa. Good night, Martha. Good night, Mr. Foster. Good night. I'll tell Mr. Webb. I'm sure you'll put that in the paper. My, it's late. Real nice choir practice, wasn't it? <gasps> Myrtle Webb, look at that moon, will you? Potato weather, for sure. Well, naturally, I didn't want to say a word about it in front of those others, but now we're alone. Really, it's the worst scandal that ever was in this town. What? Simon Stimson. Oh, now, Luella. But, Julia, to have the organist of the church drink and drunk year after year. Luella! Julia, you know he was drunk tonight. Now, Luella, we all know about Mr. Stimson, and we all know the troubles he's been through, and Dr. Ferguson knows it, too. And if Dr. Ferguson keeps him on there in that job, the only thing the rest of us can do is just not notice it. Not notice it? But it's getting worse. Oh, no, Luella, it's not. It's getting better. No, I've been in that choir twice as long as you have, and it doesn't happen nearly as often. Oh, I hate going to bed on a night like this. I better hurry, though. Those children will be sitting up till all hours. Good night, Luella. Good night, Julia. Good night, Myrtle. You can get home safely, Luella. Oh, it's as bright as day. I can see Mr. Soames scowling at the windows now. You'd think we'd been to a dance the way the men folk carry on. Good night, Julia. <laughs> Good night, Luella. I'll see you on Sunday. See you then. <laughs> Well, we had a real good time. You're late enough. Why, Frank, it's no later than usual. And you stopping at the corner, uh, gossip with a lot of hens. Oh, now, Frank, don't be grouchy. Come outside and smell my heliotrope in the moonlight. 
Oh, come on, oh. Hmm. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> so what did you do all the time I was away? Oh, I read, as usual. What were the girls gossiping about tonight? Well, believe me, Frank, there was something to gossip about. Mm, Simon Stimson, far gone, wasn't Oh, worse than I've ever seen him. How will that end, Frank? Dr. Ferguson can't forgive him forever. I guess I know more about Simon Stimson's affairs than anybody in this town. Some people ain't made for small town life. Mm. I don't know how it'll end, but there's nothing we can do. Just leave it alone. Get in. No, not yet. Frank, I'm worried about you. What are you worried about? Well, I feel it's my duty to make sure that you get a good rest and change. And if I get that legacy, yeah. I'm going to insist on it. Julia? There's no sense going over that again. Oh, Frank, I... you're just unreasonable. Come on inside, Julie. It's getting late. First thing you know, you'll catch cold. Hmm? <laughs> I gave George a piece of my mind tonight. Mm. I reckon you'll have your wood chopped <laughs> for a while anyway. No, no, start getting upstairs. Oh, dear, there's always so many things to pick up, seems like. You know, Frank, mm. Mrs. Fairchild, mm. she locks her front door every night. All those people up that part of town do. They're getting city fired. That's the trouble with them. They haven't got anything fit to burgle, and everybody knows it. <laughs> Get out, Rebecca. There's only room for one at this window. Let me just look a minute. Use your own window. Well, I did. There's no moon there. George, you know what I think, do you? I think that maybe the moon's getting near and near and there'll be a big explosion. Rebecca, you don't know anything. If the moon were getting near, the men who sit up all night with telescopes would see it first. And they'd tell us about it. I end up being all the newspapers. George? Is the moon shining on South America and Canada and half the whole world? Well, probably is. Uh -huh. 9.30. Most of the lights in town are out. There's Constable Warren checking a few doors on Main Street, and uh, here comes Editor Webb after putting his paper to bed. Good evening, Bill. Evening, Mr. Webb. Quite a moon. Eh? Uh, all quiet tonight? Simon Stimson is rolling around a little. I just saw his wife moving out to hunt for him, so I looked the other way. There he is now. Good evening, Simon. Town seems to have settled down for the night pretty well. Good evening. Yes, most of the town settled down for the night, Simon. I guess we better do the same. Can I walk along a ways with you? I don't know how that's going to end, Mr. Webb. Well, he's seen a peck of trouble, one thing after another. Oh, Bill, if you see my boy smoking any cigarettes, just give him a word, will you? He thinks a lot of you, Bill. I don't think he smokes no cigarettes, Mr. Webb. Leastways, not more than two or three a year. Well, I hope not. Good night, Bill. Good night, Mr. Webb.
Who's that up there? Is that you, Myrtle? No, Papa, it's me. Well, why aren't you in bed? I don't know. I just can't sleep yet, Papa. The moonlight's so wonderful. And the smell of Mrs. Gibbs' heliotropes. Can you smell it? Yes. Haven't any troubles on your mind, have you, Emily? Troubles, Papa? No. Well, don't let your mother catch you. <laughs> Good night, Emily. Good night, Papa. Well, I never told you about that letter that Jane Crawford got from her minister when she was sick. Well, he wrote Jane a letter, and on the envelope, the address was like this. It said, Jane Crawford, the Crawford Farm, Grover's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, United States of America. What's and funny about that? Oh, well, listen, it's not finished yet. The United States of America, the continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the universe, and the mind of God. That's what it said on the envelope. What do you know? Yeah. And the postman, he brought it just the same. What do you know? Three years gone by. Sun's come up over a thousand times. Summers and winters have cracked those mountains a little bit. Rain's brought down some dirt. Some babies weren't even born before have started speaking regular sentences. And then there are a number of others who thought themselves rather young and spry, found that they just can't bound up the stairs like they used to without their hearts fluttering a little bit. Yep, all that can happen in a thousand days. Of course, nature's been pushing and contriving in other ways, too. Some of our young folks fell in love and got married. Yep, mountains got bit back a few fractions of an inch. A couple of million gallons of water flowed over the dam, but here and there, a new home got built with a roof over it. Almost everybody in the world gets married. Know what I mean? Grover's Corners ain't hardly any exception. Almost everyone climbs into their grave married. First act was called The Daily Life. This act's called Love and Marriage. Three years later, July 7th, 1904, right after high school commencement, that's when most of our young folks jump up and get married. I guess they figure that once they have passed their final examinations in Cicero's orations and solid geometry, they suddenly feel themselves fit to get married. So early morning again, only this time it has been raining been thundering and pouring. I mean, Mrs. Gibbs' garden here is just drenched. Mrs. Webb's drenched. All those bean poles and pea vines drenched. Yesterday, over on Main Street, the rain just looked like curtains being blown along. Well, I don't know. Could get started again any minute. There's the 510 train for Boston. And here comes Ms. Webb. And Ms. Gibbs, down to cook breakfast just like it was an ordinary day. I don't have to point out to the ladies in this audience that those two ladies that you see before you have cooked three meals a day, one for 20 years and the other for 40, no summer vacation. Raised two children apiece, washed, cleaned the house, never had a nervous breakdown. Never felt themselves hard used either. It's like that... Um, Midwestern poet said, you got to love life to have life. you got to have life to love life. It's what they call a vicious circle. Here comes Howie Newsom delivering the milk. And here comes Cy Kroll delivering the papers, just like his brother Joe did before him. Morning, it's I. Morning, Howie. Anything in the papers I don't know about? Nothing much. Except for losing about the best baseball pitcher Grover's Corners ever had. Yep, I reckon he is. And now all he'll be doing is pitching hay. Whoa! Bessie! Guess I can stop and talk if I have a mind to. 
He could hit, too, and run bases. Yep, a mighty fine ball player. I don't see how he'd give up a thing like that just to get married. Would you, Howie? Well, I can't tell, Cy. Si. I never had no talent that way. Morning, Howie. Hey, morning, Bill. Morning, Mr. Warren. You're up early. Seeing if there's anything I can do to prevent a flood. The river's been rising all night. Well, Cy Crowell here is all broke up about George Gibbs retiring from baseball. Yes, sir. That's the way it goes. In 84, we had a player, Cy. Even George Gibbs couldn't have touched him. Name of Hank Todd. Went down to Maine and become a parson. A wonderful ball player. Bye. Howie, how's the weather seem to you? Oh, it ain't bad. Think maybe it'll clear off for good. Bill. Howie? Morning, Howie. Oh, morning, Miss Gibbs. It's too bad about the weather, you know. It rained so heavy, maybe it'll clear off. I certainly hope it will. Well, uh, how much did you want today? Well, I'm gonna have a house full of relations this morning, Howie. Looks like I'll need three a milk and two a cream. Three milk and a two there. a cream. My uh, wife says to tell you we hope they'll be happy. No, they will. Thank you, Howie. Tell her I hope she gets to the wedding. Oh, maybe she can. You know she'll get there if she can. Morning, Miss Webb. Good morning, Mr. Newsom. Now, I told you four quarts, but could you spare me another? Uh, yes, ma'am. And a two of cream? Mm-hmm. Is it going to rain again, Howie? Well, I was just saying to Miss Gibbs is how it may clear off. Oh. My uh, wife told me special to tell you we hope they'll be happy, Miss Webb. No, they will. Well, thank you, Mr. Newsom, and thank Mrs. Newsom. And we're counting on seeing you at the church. Hey, we wouldn't want to miss that. We wouldn't want to miss that. <laughs> Come on, Miss. Get up. Well, Ma, day has come. You're losing one of your chicks. Frank Gibbs, don't you say another word. I feel like crying every minute. Here, sit down and drink your coffee. Groom's up shaving himself, only there ain't an awful lot to shave. Whistling and singing like he's glad to leave us. Every now and then, he says, I do to the mirror. But it don't sound convincing to me. Well, I declare I don't know how he's going to get along. I've washed his clothes for him. Seen to it, his feet are dry. He's got warm things on. They're too young, Frank. Emily will never think of such things. He'll catch his death of cold within a week. I remember my wedding morning, Julia. Oh, don't you start that, Frank. I was the scaredest young fella in the state of New Hampshire. Thought I made a mistake, for sure. And uh, when I saw you coming down that aisle, I thought you were the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. Only trouble was, I'd never seen you before. <laughs> there I was in a congregational church marrying a total stranger. And how do you think I felt? Frank, weddings are perfectly awful things. Farces, that's what they are. Yep, I made something for you. Why, Julia Hersey, French toast. Oh, it ain't hard to make, and I had to do something. Hmm. How'd you sleep last night, Julia? I heard a lot of the hours struck off. Yeah. I get a shock. Every time I think of George setting out to be a family man, that great dangling thing. I tell you, Julia, there's nothing so terrifying in the world as a son. A relation of father and son is the damnedest, awkwardest. Well, mother and daughter's no picnic, let me tell you. I have a lot of troubles, I suppose. That's none of our business. Everybody has a right to their own troubles. Oh, yeah. People were meant to live two by two in this world. It ain't natural to be lonesome. <laughs> you know one of the things that scared me when I married oh, you? Go along with you. I was afraid we didn't have material for conversation more than it last a few weeks. <laughs> afraid we run out. Eat our meals in silence, that's a fact. Well, you and I have been conversing for 20 years now without any noticeable barren spells. Ah, yeah. Good weather, bad weather, it ain't very choice, but I've always got something to say. Did you hear Rebecca stirring around upstairs? No. <laughs> Only day of the year Rebecca hasn't been minding everybody's business up there. <laughs> She's hiding in her room. I got the idea she's crying. Oh, Lord sakes, this has got to stop. Rebecca? Rebecca, come and get your breakfast. 
Good morning, everybody. Only four more hours to live. George Gibbs, where do you think you're going? I'm just stepping across the grass to see my girl. Oh, George, put on your rubbers. It's raining torrents out there. You don't leave this house without oh, your repairs. But George, you will catch your death of cold and your cough all through the soup. George, do as your mother tells you. Yeah. From tomorrow on, you can kill yourself in all weathers. But while you're living in my house, you'll live wisely. Thank you. Perhaps Mrs. Webb isn't used to call us at seven in the morning. Here. Take a cup of coffee first. I'll be back in a minute. George. Morning, Mother Webb. Oh, oh, George. Oh, you frightened me. <laughs> now, George, you can stand here a minute to get out of the rain, but you understand. I can't let you in. Why not? Oh, George, you know as well as I do, a groom's not supposed to see the bride on the day of the wedding, not... Not until he sees her in church. Oh, that's just a superstition. <laughs> morning, Mr. Webb. Good morning, Judge. Mr. Webb, you don't believe in that superstition, do you? There's a lot of common sense and superstitions, Judge. Millions have followed it, George. Don't you be the first one to fly in the face of custom. How is Emily? <laughs> She hasn't waked yet. I haven't heard a sound out of her. Emily's asleep. Well, it's no wonder. We were up all night sewing and packing and... I'll tell you what I'll do, George. You sit down here and have this cup of coffee with Mr. Webb. I'll... I'll run upstairs and make sure Emily doesn't come down and surprise you. There's some bacon, too, but don't be long about it. Well, Judge, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Mr. Webb, what common sense could there be in a superstition like that? Well, Judge, on the wedding morning, a girl's head's full of... Oh, you know, uh, clothes. And one thing and another. Well, don't you think that's probably it? Yes, I never thought of that. <laughs> Girl is apt to be mite nervous on her wedding day. Oh, gee, I wish a person could get married without all that marching up and down. <laughs> Every man that's ever lived has felt that way about it, Judge. <laughs> it hasn't been any use. It's the women folk who've built up weddings, my boy. For a while now, the women have it all their own. A man looks pretty small at a wedding, Judge. All those good women standing there shoulder to shoulder, making sure the knot is tied in a mighty public way. Well, you believe in it, don't you, Mr. Webb? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Now, now don't you misunderstand me, Judge. Marriage is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And don't you forget that, Judge. No, sir. Mr. Webb, how old were you when you got married? Well, you see, uh, I'd been to college. And I'd, I'd taken a little time to get settled. But, uh, Mrs. Webb, she wasn't much older than what Emily is. Oh, age hasn't got a lot to do with it, Judge, compared with other things. Well, what were you going to say, Mr. Webb? I don't know. Was I going to say something? <laughs> you know, Judge, I was remembering the other night the advice my father gave me when I got married. Yes. He said, uh, 
Charles, he said, start right off showing who's boss. And the best thing to do is to give an order about something, even if it don't make any sense, just so she'll learn to obey, he said. And, and then he said, uh, if anything about her irritates you, her conversation or anything, just get up and leave the house. And that'll make it clear to her. And, uh, oh, yes, he said, never let your wife know about how much money you have. Never. Well, I couldn't exactly. So I took the opposite of his advice, and I've been happy ever since. So let that be a lesson to you, George. Never to ask advice of anybody on personal matters. George, are you going to raise chickens on your farm? What? Are you raising chickens on your farm? Uh, yes. <laughs> Uncle Luke's never gone in for chickens much, but I've been figuring I'm reading up about well, them. Well, Judge, a book came into my office on the Philo system of raising chickens. I wish you'd read it. Mm. I'm thinking of beginning myself in a small way in the backyard. Uh, I'm going to put an incubator in the cellar. Charles Webb, are you talking about that incubator again? I thought the two of you would be talking about something worthwhile. Well, Myrtle, if you want to give the boy some good advice, I'll go upstairs. George, Emily has to come down and eat her breakfast. Now, she sends you her love, but she doesn't want to lay eyes on you. So, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Myrtle. I guess you never heard of that older superstition. What do you mean, Chow? Since the caveman. No bridegroom should see his father-in-law on the day of the wedding. Now, remember that. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Webb. Now, I have to interrupt you again. See, I want to know how all this began. This wedding. This plan to spend a lifetime together. I am interested in how big things like that get started. Well, you know how it is. You're 20, 21 years old. You make a few decisions, then wham! You're 70. You've been a lawyer. A lawyer for 50 years. And that white-haired lady sitting next to you has shared over 50,000 meals with you. How do big things like that get started? Well, George and Emily are going to show you a conversation they had when they first found out, as the saying goes, that they were meant for each other. But before they do, I want you to try and remember what it was like when you were very young. And especially when you were first in love. It was like you were sleepwalking. Couldn't see the street you were walking on. Couldn't hear anything anybody was saying here. Just like you were a little bit crazy. Remember that, will you? Dale will be coming out of school now at 3 o'clock. George has just been elected president of the senior class. And since it's June, that means he's going to be president all next year. And Emily? Been elected secretary and treasurer. Here they come, now. Well, tell your mother you have to. Goodbye. Goodbye, Helen. Goodbye, Fred. Emily? Uh, can I uh, carry your books home for you? Why, uh, thank you. It isn't far. Oh, uh, excuse me one minute, Emily, will you? Uh, say, Bob, if I'm a little late, start practice. And give Herb some long high ones. Goodbye, Lizzie. Oh, goodbye. I'm awful glad you were elected too, Emily. Thank you. Emily, why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. Well, you treat me so funny lately. Well, since you ask me, I might as well say it right out, George. Oh, goodbye, Miss Cochran. Uh, goodbye, Miss Cochran. What? What is it? I don't like the whole change that's come over you in the last year. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I've just got to tell the truth and shame the devil. A change? What do you mean? 
Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot, and I used to watch you while you did everything, because we'd been friends so long. And then you began spending all your time at baseball, and you never stopped to speak to anybody anymore, not to really speak, not even to your own family, you didn't. And George, it's a fact. Ever since you've been elected captain, you've got awful stuck up and conceited, and all the girls say so. And it hurts me to hear him say it, but I've got to agree with him a little because it's true. Gosh, Emily. I never thought such a thing was happening to me. I guess it's hard for a fella not to have some faults creep into his character. <laughs> I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think he should be. I don't think it's possible to be perfect, Emily. Well, my father is. And as far as I can see, your father is. There's no reason on earth why you shouldn't be, too. Well, I feel it's the other way around. The men aren't naturally good, but girls are. Well, you might as well know right now that I'm not perfect. It's not as easy for a girl to be perfect as a man. Because, well, we girls are more nervous. Now, I'm sorry I said all that about you. I don't know what made me say it. Oh, Emily. Now I can see it's not the truth at all. And I suddenly feel it's not important anyway. Emily. Emily, would you, would you like to go for an ice cream soda or something before you go home? Why, um, thank you, I, I would. Oh, hello, Stu, how are you? Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Slocum. Mr. Morgan? Hello? George! Emily! What do you have? Emily Webb, what you've been crying about? She just got an awful scare, Mr. Morgan. That hardware store wagon almost ran over. Everybody says Tom Huckins drives like a crazy man. You look all shook up. I'll get you a glass of water. Gotta look both ways crossing Main Street nowadays. Just gets worse every year. So, what do you have? I'll have a strawberry phosphate, Mr. Morgan. Oh, no, no, Emily, have a soda with me. Well, uh, two um, strawberry ice cream sodas, Mr. Morgan. Two strawberry ice cream sodas coming up. Yes, sir, I want to tell you. There are 225 horses in Grover's Corners. This minute I'm talking to you. State inspector was in here yesterday. Now they got these automobiles coming along. Tell you, best thing to do is stay at home. You know, I can remember when dogs used to lie in the middle of Main Street all day long, and nothing had ever come by to disturb them. This is Alice? I hear you. They're so expensive. No, no, don't you think of that, Emily. We're celebrating our election. <laughs> and then, you know what else I'm celebrating? No. I'm celebrating because I've got a friend who tells me all the things that ought to be told me. Oh, George, please don't think of that. I don't know why I said it. It's not true. You're... No, you stick to it, Emily. I'm glad you spoke to me like you did, but you'll see. I'm going to change so quick. You bet I'm going to change. And Emily, I want to ask you a favor. What? Emily, if I go away to State Agriculture College next year, will you write me a letter? Once in a while? I certainly will. I certainly will, George. Huh. 
It certainly seems like being away three years, you'd get out of touch with things. Maybe letters from Grover's Corners wouldn't be so interesting after a while. Grover's Corners isn't a very important place when you think of all New Hampshire. But I think it's a very nice town. The day wouldn't come when I wouldn't want to know everything about our town. I know that's true, Emily. Well, I'll try to make the letters interesting. You know, Emily, whenever I meet a farmer, I ask him if he thinks it's important to go to agriculture school, uh, to be a good farmer. Some of them even say it's a, a waste of time. You can get all that stuff anyway from the pamphlets the, the government sends out. And Uncle Luke's getting old. He's about ready for me to start in taking over his farm tomorrow if I could. My. And like you say, being gone all that time in other places, meeting other people. Oh, gosh, if anything like that can happen, I don't want to go away. I, I guess new people probably aren't any better than old ones. I bet they almost never are. Emily, I feel you're, you're as good a friend as I've got. I, I don't need to go and meet the people in other towns. But George, maybe it's very important for you to go and learn all that about cattle judging and soils and those things. Of course, I don't know. Well, Emily, I'm going to make up my mind right now. I won't go. I'll tell Pa about it tonight. But, George, I don't see why you have to decide right now. It's a whole year away. Emily, I'm glad you spoke to me about that fault in my character. What you said was right, but there was one thing, there was one thing wrong in it. And that's where you said that I wasn't noticing people, and you, for instance. Why, you say you were watching me when I did everything. Why, I was doing the same thing about you all the time. Oh, why, sure, I always thought about you as one of the chief people I thought about. I always made sure where you were sitting on the bleachers and who you were with. And three days now, I've been trying to walk home with you. But something's always gotten in the way. Yesterday, I was standing over by the wall waiting for you, and you walked home, Miss Corcoran. <laughs> George, life's awful funny. How could I have known that? I thought that you... Listen, Emily. I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to agricultural school. I think that once you found a person you're very fond of, I mean, a, a person who's fond of you too and who likes you well enough to be interested in your character, I think that's just as important as college is. Even more so. That's what I think. I think that's awfully important too. Emily, you... Yes, George? If I do improve and make a big change, would you be... I mean, could you be my... I... I am now. And I always have been. Oh, I guess this is an important talk we've been having. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wait just a minute. I'll, I'll walk you home. Mr. Morgan, we're ready. Okay. Mr. Morgan. I'll have to go home and get the money to pay you for this. George Gibbs, you mean to say you came yes, in... Yes, but I have reasons, Mr. Morgan. Look, here's my gold watch to keep until I come back with the money. And if Keep I... the watch, George. I'll trust you. I'll be back in five I'll minutes. I'll trust you for ten years, George, not a minute longer. <laughs> get over your scare, Emily. Oh, yes, Mr. Morgan. Thank you. It was nothing. 
I'm ready. And now, let's get on with the wedding. A lot of things to be said about a wedding. A lot of thoughts going on during a wedding. We can't get them all into one wedding, especially a wedding at Grover's Corners, where weddings are mighty short and plain. In this play, I take the part of the minister. Though that gives me the right to say a few more things. Yes, for a while the play is going to get a little serious. You see, some churches say that marriage is a sacrament. I don't know what that means, but I can guess. It's like Mrs. Gibbs said a few minutes ago. People are meant to live two by two. This is a good wedding. The people are young, but they come from a good state, and they chose right. Of course, the real hero of the scene isn't on stage at all. And we all know who that is. It's like that, um, oh, that European fella said. Every time a child is born into this world, it's nature's attempt to make a perfect human being. Well, we've all seen nature pushing and contriving for some time now. We all know she's interested in quantity, but I think she's interested in quality too. Maybe... Maybe she's going to make another great governor for New Hampshire. That's what Emily hopes. And don't forget the other witnesses to this wedding. The ancestors, millions of them, they set out to live life two by two. Millions of them. So that's my sermon. Wasn't very long anyway. I don't know why on earth I should be crying. I suppose there's nothing to be crying about. It came over me this morning at breakfast. There was Emily eating her breakfast as she's done for 17 years. And she's going out of my house. I suppose that's it. And Emily, she suddenly said, I can't eat another mouthful. And she put her head on the table and she cried. Oh, I've just got to say it. It's downright cruel the way we send girls out into marriages like that. It's cruel. I know. But I just couldn't bring myself to say anything about it. I went into it blind as a bad myself. The whole world's wrong. That's what's the matter. Oh. There they come. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. George. George. Yow. Yow. Look at him, he's scared to death. Oh, George. George. Hey, you don't have to look so innocent, you old geezer. We know what you're thinking. Go to it, big boy, you old geezer. All you. right, all right, all right. That's enough of that. There used to be an awful lot of that kind of thing in weddings in the old days, Rome and later. But we're more civilized now. So they say. George. George, what's the matter? Ma, uh, I don't want to grow old. Why is everybody pushing me so? Why, George, you want to No, Ma, listen to me. No, George, you're a man now. Listen, Ma, for 
the last time I'm asking you. All I want to do is be a fellow. George, now you stop it. If anybody should hear you, now I'm ashamed of you. What? Where's Emily? Where? Oh, George. Oh, you gave me such a turn. <laughs> Cheer up, Ma. I'm getting married. Just let me catch my breath a minute. Now, Ma, you save Thursday night. Emily and I are coming over for dinner every Thursday night. You'll see. Why, Ma, you look all funny. What, what are you crying for? Oh, well, come on, Ma. We got to get ready for this. Jeez, Ma. I never felt so alone in my whole life. And George over there. I hate him. I wish I were dead. Emily, Emily, don't be upset. Oh, but Papa, darling, I don't want to get married. Oh, hush now. Everything's all right. Why can't I stay for a while, just as I am? Let's go away. Uh, no, now you stop and think a minute. Don't you remember what you used to say all the time? That I was your girl. Well, there must be lots of places we could go to. I'd work for you. I could keep house. Oh, hush. You <laughs> mustn't think about such things. You're just nervous, that's all. Now, now... Judge? Judge, will you come here a minute? Well, you are marrying the best young fella in the world. Judge is a fine fellow. But, Papa, I'm... I am giving away my daughter, Judge. Do you think you can take care of her? Mr. Webb, I want to. I want to try. Emily, I'm going to do my best. I love you, Emily. I need you. Well, if you love me, help me. All I want is someone to love me. I will, Emily. Emily, I'll try. And I mean forever. Do you hear? Forever and ever. They're waiting for us. And now you know everything is going to be all right. You, George, take this woman, Emily, to be your lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward. Perfectly lovely yes, wedding. Yes, Loveliest yes. wedding I ever saw. So oh, I do love a good wedding, don't you? Doesn't she make a lovely bride? I do. Do you, Emily, take this man, George, to be your lawful wedded husband? Don't know when I've seen such a lovely wedding, but I always cry. Don't know why it is, but I always cry. I just like to see young people happy, don't you? Oh, I think it's lovely. I do.
I've married 200 couples in my day. Do I believe in it? I don't know. I suppose I do. M marries N, millions of them. The cottage, the go-kart, Sunday afternoon drives in the Ford, the first rheumatism, grandchildren, second rheumatism, deathbed, reading of the will. Once in a thousand times, it's interesting. Nine years gone by. Summer, 1913. Gradual changes in Grover's Corners. Horses are getting rare. Farmers are coming into town now in Fords. People are starting to lock their house doors at night. Ain't been no burglars around, but everybody's heard about them. But for the most part, things don't change much around here. This is an important part of Grover's Corners. It's up on a hill, windy hill, lots of clouds, lots of sky. <laughs> lots of sun, moon, and stars, too. On a fine day, you can climb up here and just see range after range of hills. Awful blue they are up there by Lake Sunapee and Lake Winnipesaukee. Climb up even higher, see all the way to the White Mountains and Mount Washington where Conway, North Conway is. And then, of course, we got our own favorite mountain, Mount Monadnock, and all the little towns lie around it, Jaffrey and North Jaffrey and Peterborough and Dublin, and right down there is Grover's Corner. Beautiful spot up here. Mountain laurel and lilac. Always wondered why people wanted to be buried in places like Brooklyn. Woodlawn, when they could come up here and spend the same time in New Hampshire. These are the old stones here. 1660, 1670. Strong-minded people have come a long way to be independent. And the summer folks come up here and laugh at the funny sayings on the stones. Guess that don't do no harm. Genealogists come up here all the way from Boston paid for by city folk to check on their ancestors, make sure their daughters of the American Revolution are the Mayflower. Well, <laughs> I guess that don't do no harm either. Civil War veterans here, iron flags on their graves. New Hampshire boys had a notion the Union ought to be kept together, though they'd never seen more than about 50 miles of it. All they knew was the name the United States of America. United States of America. And they went out and died about it. This is a new part here. You all remember Mrs. Gibbs and Mr. Stimson, the organist at the Congregational Church, and uh, 
Mrs. Soames, who enjoyed the wedding so much, and lots of others. There's Editor Webster Wallace. His appendix burst while he was on a Boy Scout trip to Crawford Notch. Yes, an awful lot of sorrow gets quieted down up here. People just wild with grief bring their relatives up this hill and times. Rainy days, sunny days, snow. We all know how it is. A lot of thoughts come up here day and night. Ain't no post office. You know, there are some things that we all know, but we don't take them out much and look at them. We all know that something is eternal. And it ain't houses. It ain't names. It ain't the earth. It ain't the stars. We all know deep down that there is something eternal. And that something has to do with human beings. Greatest people ever born have been telling us that for 5,000 years. But you would be surprised the number of people just let go of that fact. Yes, we all know in our bones that there is something eternal about every human being. The dead, they don't stay interested in us living very long. Gradually, they just let go hold of the earth and the ambitions they had, pleasures they had, things they suffered, people they loved, they get weaned away from earth. Well, that's the way I put it, they get weaned away. They stay here while that earth part of them burns away, just burns itself out. And all that time, they're just slowly losing interest in Grover's Corners. They're waiting. They're waiting for something they know is going to happen, something big and important. Aren't they waiting for that eternal part of them to just come out clear? Some of the things that they say may be going to hurt your feelings, but that's the way it is. I mean, mother and daughter, husband and wife, enemy and enemy, money and miser. All those terribly important things, they just pale away up here. And what's left? What is left when the memory is gone? And your identity, Mrs. Smith. Well, here come some living people now. That's Joe Stoddard, our undertaker, supervising a new-made grave. Sam Craig left Grover's Corners to go out west. Good afternoon, Joe Stoddard. Good afternoon. Let me see now. Do I know you? I'm Sam Craig. Gracious sakes alive of all people. Should have known you'd be back for the funeral. Been away a long time, Sam. Yes, I've been away over 12 years. <laughs> I'm in business out of Buffalo now, Joe, but I was in the East when I got the news of my cousin's death, so I thought I'd combine things a little and come back and see the old home. You look well. Yes, yes. Can't complain. Very sad our journey today, Samuel. Yes. Yes, yes, I always say I hate to supervise what a young person has taken. They'll be coming here in a few minutes now. I had to come here early today. My son is supervising at the home. Well, that's old Farmer McCarthy. I used to do chores for him after school. He had lumbago. Yes, we brought Farmer McCarthy here a number of years ago now. Why, this is my Aunt Julia. Well, I'd forgotten that she... Of course. Yes, Doc Gibbs lost his wife two, three years ago, about the same time. Not today, another pretty bad blow for him, too. That's my sister Carrie's boy, Sam, Sam Craig. I'm always uncomfortable when they're around. Oh, now, Simon. Do they choose their own verses much, Joe? No, not usual. Mostly the bereaved pick a verse. Doesn't sound like Aunt Julia. Well, there aren't many of those Hersey sisters left, I suppose. Let me see, I wanted to look at my father's and mother's... Over there with the Craigs, Avenue F. He was the organist at church, wasn't he? He drank a lot, we used to say. Nobody's supposed to know about it. He's seen a peck of trouble, took his own life. Oh, did he? Hung himself in the attic. They tried to hush it up, of course, but it got round. Chose his own epitaph. You can see it right there. It ain't a verse, exactly. Why, it's just some notes of music. What is it? Oh, I wouldn't know. They wrote it up in the Boston papers at the time. 
Joe, what did she die of? Who? My cousin. Oh, didn't you know? She had trouble bringing a baby into the world. Twas the second, though. There's a little boy about four years old. And the guy's gonna be here. Yes, ain't much more room over here among the Gibbs. So we'll open a whole new Gibbs section over there by Avenue B. Oh, I see they're coming. You'll excuse me now. Who is it, Julia? My daughter-in-law, Emily, Emily Webb. Well, I declare. The road up here must have been awfully muddy. What did she die of, Julia? Childbirth. Childbirth. I'd forgotten all about that. My, wasn't life awful? And wonderful. Wonderful, was it? Oh, now, Simon, remember. I remember Emily's wedding. Wasn't it a lovely wedding? And I remember her reading the class poem at graduation exercises. Emily was one of the brightest girls ever to graduate high school. I've heard Principal Wilkins say so time after time. I called on them at their new farm right before I died. Perfectly beautiful farm. Lived on the same road we lived on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right smart farm. I always liked that hymn. I was hoping they'd sing a hymn. Hello, Emily. Hello, Miss Gibbs. Hello, Mother Gibbs. Emily. It's raining. Yes? They'll be gone soon, dear. Just rest yourself. It seems thousands and thousands of years since I... Papa remembered that that was my favorite hymn. Oh, I wish I'd been here a long time. I don't like being new here. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Stimson? How do you do, Emily? Mother Gibbs, George and I have made that farm into just the best place you ever saw. We thought of you all the time. We wanted to show you the new barn and a great long cement drinking fountain for the stock. We bought that out of the money you left us. I did? Don't you remember, Mother Gibbs? The legacy you left us, why, it was over $350. Oh, yes, yes, Emily. Well. There's a patent device on this drinking fountain so that it never overflows, Mother Gibbs, and it never sinks below a certain mark they have there. It's fine. It won't be the same to George without me, but it's a lovely farm. Life people don't understand, do they? No, dear, not very much. They're sort of shut up in little boxes, aren't they? I feel as though I knew them last a thousand years ago. My boy is spending the day at Mrs. Carter's. Oh, Mr. Carter, my little boy is spending the day at your house. Is he? Yes. He loves it there. Oh, Mother Gibbs, we have a Ford, too. Never gives any trouble. I don't drive, though. Mother Gibbs, when does this feeling go away of being one of them? How long Shh, does it... Just wait and be patient. I know. Look, they're finished. They're going. Shh. Look, Father Gibbs is bringing some of my flowers to you.
He looks just like George, doesn't he? Oh, Mother Gibbs, I never realized before how troubled and how, how in the dark life people are. Look at him. I loved him so. From morning till night, that's all they are. Troubled. A little cooler than it was. Ah, oh, yeah, the rains cooled it off a little. Northeast winds always do the same thing, don't they? If it ain't rain, it's a three-day blow. But, Mother Gibbs, one can go back. One can go back there again into living. I feel it. I know it. Just then, for a moment, I was thinking about... about the farm. And for a minute, I was there, and my baby was on my lap as plain oh, as day. Yes, dear, of course you can. I can go back there and live all those days over again. Why not? All I can say, Emily, is don't. But it's true, isn't it? I can go and live back there again. Yes. Some have tried, but they soon come back here. Don't do it, Emily. Emily, don't. It's not what you think it'd be. But I won't live over a sad day. I'll choose a happy one. Huh. I'll choose the day I first knew that I loved George. Oh, no. No, why should that be painful? Because you not only live it, you watch yourself living it. And as you do, you see the things that those people down there never know. You see the future. You know what's going to happen. But is that painful? Why? Well, that's not the only reason you shouldn't do it, Emily. When you've been here longer, you'll understand. Our life here is to forget all that and to think about what is ahead and be ready for what is ahead. When you've been here longer, you'll understand. But Mother Gibbs, how can I ever forget that life? It's all I know. It's all I have. Oh, Emily, it isn't wise. Really, it isn't. But it's a thing I must know for myself. I'll choose a happy day anyway. No. At least choose an unimportant day. Choose the least important day of your life. It will be important enough. Well, then, it can't be since I was married. Or since the baby was born. I can choose a birthday, at least. Can't I? I choose my twelfth birthday. All right. February 11th, 1899, a Tuesday. Any particular time of day? Oh, I want the whole day. We'll begin at dawn. You remember it had been snowing, but it stopped the night before and they'd begun clearing the roads. The sun's coming up. Well, look, there's Main Street. <laughs> oh, and that's... Mr. Morgan's drugstore before he changed it. And there's the livery stable. 1899, 14 years ago. Oh, that's the town I knew as a little girl. And look, this is the old white fence that used to be around our house, so I'd forgotten that. I love it, so. Are they inside? Your mother will be coming down to cook breakfast. Will she? Yes. Your father had been away for a couple of days, but he came back on the early morning train. No. Yes, he'd been back to his old college to make a speech in western New York at Clinton. Look, there's Howie Newsom. <laughs> and there's our policeman. But he's dead. He died. Hey, morning, Bill. Morning, Howie. Uh, you're up early. Been rescuing a party. Down near froze to death down by Polish town there. Got drunk and lay out in the snow drifts. Thought he was in bed when I shook him. <laughs> oh, there's Joe Crow. Good morning, Mr. Warren. Morning, Howie. Uh, morning, Joe. Morning, Joe. Children, Wally, Emily, time to wake up. Mama, I'm here. Oh, how young Mama looks. I didn't know Mama was ever that young. You can come and dress by the fire if you like, but hurry! Good morning, Mr. Oh, Newsom. Good morning, Miss Webb. Oh, it's cold. Yep, it's ten below by my barn, Miss Webb. Think of it. Will you keep yourself wrapped up now? 
Come on, boys. Get up. Mama, I can't find my blue hair ribbon anywhere. Well, just open your eyes, dear. I laid it out special for you on the dresser. If it was a snake, it would bite you. Yes. Good morning, yes. Bill. Morning, Mr. Webb. Hey, you're up early. Yes, just been back to my old college in New York State. Any trouble here? I was called up this morning to rescue a Polish fella. Down near froze to death he was. We must get it in the paper. Twent much. Good morning, Mother. How'd it go, Charles? Oh, fine, I guess I told him a few things. Everything all right here? Oh, I can't think of anything that happened special. It's been right cold, though. Howie Newsom says it's 10 below over to his barn. Yes, well, it's colder than that at Hamilton College. Students' ears are falling off. It ain't Christian. <laughs> Paper have any mistakes in it? None that I noticed. Oh, coffee's ready if you want it. Don't forget, it's Emily's birthday. Did you get her something? Yes, I've got something right here. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? Oh, don't interrupt her now, Charles. She's slow enough as it is. You can see her at breakfast. Children, hurry. I can't bear it. They're so young and beautiful. Why did they ever have to get old? Mama, I'm here. <laughs> I'm grown up. I love you all. Everything. I can't look at everything hard enough. Can I go in? Good morning, Mama. Well, a very happy birthday to my dear girl and many happy returns. There are surprises waiting for you on the table. Oh, Mama, you shouldn't have. I can't. I can't. But birthday or no birthday, I want you to eat your breakfast good and slow. I want you to grow up to be a good, strong girl. Oh, that in the blue paper is from your Aunt Carrie. And I reckon you can guess who brought the postcard album. I found it on the doorstep when I went to pick up the milk. George Gibbs. He must have come out in the cold pretty early. That was right nice of him. Oh, George. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. No. Oh. Now eat that bacon good and slow. It'll keep you nice and warm on a cold day. Oh, Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone by. I'm dead. You're a grandmother, Mama. I married George Gibbs, Mama. Mama, Wally's dead, too. His appendix burst on a camping trip to Crawford Notch. We felt just terrible about it. Don't you remember? But just for a moment now, we're all together. Mama, just for a moment, let's be happy. Let's look at one another. That in the yellow paper is something I found up in the attic amongst your grandmother's things. I think you're old enough to wear it. I thought you'd like it. Oh, and this is from you. Why, Mama, it's just lovely, and it's just what I wanted. It's beautiful. Oh, I was hoping you'd like it. I hunted all over for it. Your Aunt Nora couldn't find one in Concord, so I had to send all the way to Boston for it. Wally has a present for you, too. He made it in manual training class, and he is very proud of it, so make a big fuss. Your father has a surprise for you. I don't know what it is myself, but... Oh, shh. Here he comes. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? I can't, I can't, I, I can't go on. It goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. I didn't realize. So, all that was going on, and we never noticed. 
take me back. Up the hill. To my grave. But first, wait. One more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners. Mama and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking and my butternut tree and Mama's sunflowers. dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anyone to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it every, every minute? No. Saints and poets, maybe. They do some. I'm ready to go back. Were you happy? No, I should have listened to you. That's all human beings are. Just blind people? Oh, look, it's clearing up. The stars are coming out. Oh, Mr. Stimson, I should have listened to them. Yes. Now you know. Now you know. That's what it was to be alive. To move about in a cloud of ignorance. To go up and down, trampling on the feelings of those of those about you, to spend and waste time as though you had a million years, to be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion or another. Now you know. That was the happy existence you wanted to go back to, ignorance and blindness. Well, that's not the whole truth. And you know it, Simon Stimson. Emily. Look at that star. I forget its name. My boy Joel, he was a sailor. He knew all the stars. He'd sit on the porch evenings and tell them all by name. Yes, sir. Oh, it was wonderful. The star's mighty good company. Yes. Yes, it is. There's one of them coming. That's funny. Take no time for him to be here. Goodness sakes. Mother Gibbs, it's George. Shh, Emily, rest yourself. It's George. My boy Joel, who knew the stars, he used to say it took millions of years for that little speck of light to get down here to Earth. <laughs> Don't seem how a body could believe it, but... That's what he used to say, millions of years. Goodness, that ain't no way to behave. He ought to be home. Mother Gibbs. Yes, dear. They don't understand, do they? No, dear. They don't understand. Most everyone's asleep in Grover's Corners. There are a few lights on. Shorty Hawkins just watched the Albany train go by. And uh, up at the livery, there are some boys up late talking. It's clearing up. 
There are the stars doing their old crisscross in the skies. You know, scholars haven't settled the matter yet, but they seem to think that there are no living beings up there. Just chalk and fire. Only this one is straining away. Straining away all the time. Trying to make something of itself. In fact, every 16 hours, the strain gets to be so great that everyone just lies down and takes a rest. 11 o'clock in Grover's Corners. Everyone's resting in Grover's Corners. Tomorrow's going to be another day. You get a good night's rest, too. Good night.